Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as the Pasadena Public Library is thrilled to be able to welcome back LA Times Assistant Travel Editor, Mary Fergonye. Um, she made a wonderful presentation for us this summer, a part of Summer Reading Club, where to travel, where to go in the summertime. And so now she's going to be talking about um, programs for um, for um, winter travel, and she's going to be focusing on California. So um, in order to have you have the most enjoyable opportunity to visit and enjoy the program today, we have live transcript that you may um, select for yourself on your computer. Also, if you could please mute yourself. Following the program, Mary has agreed to take questions. So please put your questions in chat and I will ask the questions. And um, we just can't thank Mary enough for all of her time and efforts for the Pasadena Public Library for holiday travel ideas. I'm sure everybody is looking forward to getting out and about somewhat this holiday. So I want to welcome Mary and thank her very much again. Mary? Christine, thank you so much. That is just a wonderful, wonderful introduction. Um, when we set this up, I wasn't thinking that we would be facing another phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I kind of shifted my focus to California destinations. And what I want to tell people just generally about travel, if you're going to travel over the holiday season, I'm sure many, many of you are. I call it, please make it a no surprises trip or a no surprises vacation. And by that, I mean, really check with the area that you're going to, the country you're going to, the county you're going to, the state, to make sure that when you get there, you won't have any surprises of what's required, whether it's a vaccine card, an ID, a COVID test, because those could all be things that may delay your travel. Um, I don't know how comfortable people feel right now about going to the airport and getting on a flight, but I decided that I know we've been doing road trips for a couple of years in California, but California is so spectacular and it's spectacular in winter too. So I thought, you know, I would mostly talk about destinations here. Um, a, a winter road trip is very different from summer. Um, I urge everyone always to go midweek because it's quieter, but you'll see less crowds and better temperatures particularly in places that we love to go in winter. And of course, that means the deserts. Um, Joshua Tree and Death Valley, I think are the two deserts everybody loves. But one thing I wanna tell you about is you should absolutely get your national park pass in advance to go into the park. It's, I think each park is $30. You can buy your pass online and that's good for seven days. So if you're there for a long weekend or if you're there midweek, it's a one-time uh, cost. Joshua Tree is fabulous, but one thing you have to know is that it has doubled, the number of visitors has doubled in the past five years. So if you haven't been to Joshua Tree in a while and you're thinking it's gonna be this really quiet place, 2.4 million visitors went to Joshua Tree in 2020. That was during the pandemic. So um, the park advises, Entering before 10 a.m., not trying to leave at sunset, uh, because those are times when there can be a lot of traffic uh, congestion. That said, there are fabulous trails. And one of the ones I want to recommend to people that you might not think about, it's a popular one. It's good for families because it's only about a mile. And that's the Barker Dam trail, which is, it kind of gets you out. It gets you into the landscape. And there's also water there which is so rare in the desert. So it's good for bird watchers. It's good for kids who wanna climb on rocks and, and kind of just play in the water. So I always recommend that one. Uh, people that want a longer hike may wanna do the Wonderland of Rocks, it's about five miles. I think that's a point to point, but I think you can also make, uh, you know, do just uh, go as far as you like and come back. And indeed, the title is kind of self-explanatory where you just see these wonderful boulder formations. Death Valley, 
Uh, Death Valley is terrific in winter. Uh, they had a remarkable, I mean, to me, it seemed high. I think they had five deaths over the summer due to the heat. So of course, the best time to go to the desert is in winter and then spring is when the crowds really come out. One of the places that I like to recommend in Death Valley that um, people may overlook is a little canyon. It's called Mosaic Canyon. It's a four mile hike. And you go into this, this little narrow, it's not a slot canyon, it's wide, but it's kind of a granite wash, but you've got these wonderful smooth rock walls uh, that you can just kind of kind of jimmy your way in and, and kind of feel that. And it does go into what I've always found to be a dry waterfall area. So, you know, put it on your list and you're undoubtedly gonna go to Badwater Basin, the lowest point in the continental US. You're undoubtedly gonna go to Zabriskie Point, but I would also put uh, Mosaic Canyon on your list. Another desert experience, my colleague Christopher Reynolds wrote a story uh, 40 Best California Experiences, the Winter Edition, which you'll find on the LA Times website. He mentions a place I just love, Indian Canyons. If you haven't been there, one of the places, one of the reasons to go is they have um, native palm trees, native only to California. We see so many non-native palm trees in Southern California. So this is a real treat. Um, it's in Palm Springs, but it's operated by the Cayente Band of Cahuilla Indians. So you pay a separate, it's not a national park, it's a private um, Cahuilla Indian land. And it's, it's just lovely. There are little oases along the way. Trails are pretty easy. Maybe I think the longest one is about five miles. Most are in the two to three mile category. Flat walking, great for photographers, good for birders as well. I'm gonna zip over to the coast. I'm gonna recommend in San Simeon, I would say probably about three hours north of us, four hours, is the Piedras Blancas Elephant Seal Rookery at San Simeon. And this is the time of year when the elephant the seals come to hang out, to kind of fight a little bit over, over mates. They also mate there and it's free. You can just pull off the road. You know, if you're already doing a trip up north, it's a great pullout. It's a great leg stretcher. Um, they ask that you stay at least 25 feet away from elephant seals because we want to give these are wild creatures. We want to give them plenty of space, but it's a great place, especially, again, if you're a family traveling, it, it's a great stop. And uh, they will be in the in the when you pull off, it's a cove, it's a private beach cove, and you will see hundreds of them because it is a place they regularly come back to. On your way is the, you know, on your way as we go north, the Pismo Beach Monarch Butterfly Grove. Uh, last year, the monarchs didn't appear and uh, wildlife biologists were extremely concerned. Uh, this is a population that's had problems, all kind of habitat, disappearing habitat and whatnot. The butter, the good news is the butterflies appear to be back this year. I went up to Pismo Beach, this particular monarch sanctuary, oh, a couple months, no, it was last month actually, and um, saw butterflies. And one thing I will tell you, I think people think that butterflies are gonna be flying all around them. It's a rather shady grove. So what you will see is kind of the ribbons of butterflies. Uh, they, they're just kind of hanging out. Uh, at first, you'll just think they're leaves of the trees. They love eucalyptus trees, even though they're non-native. And you'll think they're just leaves of the trees, but you have to look a little more carefully. If you are there on a sunny day, they will be active and you will see butterflies all over the place. I'm going to go back to my colleague Chris Reynolds list of the 40 best California experiences. This isn't a place I've been to, but Chris wrote about it. It's called Sunnylands, one word, in Rancho Mirage. And it is the former estate of Walter and Leonor Annenberg. And Walter Annenberg was the big journalism mogul. Uh, he at one time owned TV Guide, other publications. And this was their home. 
It's a mid-century home built in 1966. And apparently in winter, which would be now, you can get house tours. I think uh, he writes that a 90 minute house tour is $49. Um, apparently there are gardens to see there, this lovely mid-century home. Um, so that may be worth a stop for those of you heading south towards San Diego Way. All right, so we're gonna start our slideshow of some other places you should visit this winter. And yeah, I kind of had to put the Hollywood sign up there. This is one of my all time favorite hikes. So if you go no farther than your wild backyard, which would be Griffith Park, which turned 125 this year, I highly recommend a hike to the Hollywood sign. You can go by day which makes sense because then you could follow the signs. If you know your way or go with someone who knows the way, you could go at night and you get to see the city lights. And you will also look out and see uh, lighted Christmas trees on the tops of buildings in Hollywood and elsewhere, because this is just a great hike for views. Um, I always think of the Hollywood sign. I think it was in the 60s or 70s, the city realized, or at least the uh, Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, that they didn't own the land the sign was on. And the sign needed some, some love and some refurbishing. So I think it was in 1977, they decided to raise money to buy the land and to refurbish the sign um, by auctioning off each letter of the sign. So Hugh Hefner bought the Y. Rocker Alice Cooper bought the O, Andy Williams bought the W, and so it went. Uh, each letter went for about $27,000. And uh, it's just, it's kind of a way that we preserved our biggest landmark. The reason, you know, one of the reasons why people go to Griffith Park is to have their photo taken in front of the sign. So I had to put a plug in for the Hollywood sign. Next slide. Okay. Also, Flacco Lake is a really interesting area. I went there because I had a friend who showed me where it was. It's not really on the way to anywhere. So you are in San Luis Obispo County in what I would call near the town of Nipomo. You, as you approach the state park, you are in um, basically in, in farmlands. And you will see, you'll be on narrow roads where buses bring farm workers in, you know, kind of load them up at night and bring them in, uh, bring them back to their homes. So you kind of go through these farmlands and you think, wow, I have no idea where this is taking me, you know, because you've mapped it on your Google Maps or your ways. And eventually you come to a lot and the trail begins. And this is just, I love this destination. It is not a swimming destination. It is a wildlife destination. And it's just, you can take a short hike. The causeway that you see here takes you out on this bridge. Again, really good for photographers, for uh, bird watchers. And it's just a really peaceful setting. I think it's a place not that many people know. As you continue on the causeway, you come to this lovely, um, very verdant area where you're approaching the dunes, uh, uh, you know, the beach and the dunes. So you just keep walking and you're passing lupin and you're passing some, some uh, kind of dune flowers and whatnot. And it, it's just so pretty. It's uh, what I would call a really low, low profile chaparral kind of stuff. And then you get to the beach and the dunes, and it is absolutely stunning. Um, if you know where the Nipomo dunes are, that's the general area you're in, but it is just a lovely, I, what I like most about the state park is that it combines both this interior lake as well as you know an ocean experience. So you can take as long as you like. There's even a bathroom on the way in between the lake and the dunes. And um, it's a beautiful, easy hike. And one I recommend you stop at if you are like heading up the coast, it's an easy uh, detour off Highway 1 or the 101. Next slide. Moral Bay. I'm sure many, many 
have been to Morro Bay. I still love going to this place. Going in winter to me means way less crowds. And one of the reasons to go is to see the otters. And you can see otters, the sea otters, S-E-A, in uh, the photo on the right, you see Morro Rock and you see those little, those little bodies. You actually get a much better view when you're in person. It was funny, I, we, I was in Morro Bay. Um, my friend and I had gone to an Italian restaurant at the end of the evening. Our hostess said, oh, have you seen the sea otters? And sent us to this little cove. The cove is not hard to find. And um, we went out the next morning and sure enough, there they were about a dozen of them. Sometimes I did not see this. Sometimes they have baby otters on their stomach. Um, just a pair of binoculars and you will get really good close up views of these creatures that have really rebounded after being hunted almost to extinction. Um, you can also continue on and take a hike out to the rock. Great place to bird watch. Uh, you can go kayaking uh, at, at various places uh, near the rock. But um, I think Morro Bay is a great stop it's a super cute community and the sea otters make it reason enough to go. Okay, MacArthur Bernie Falls. I went in last May, so I was not there in winter. This is in the town of Bernie, way up near Lassen National Park and Lassen National Forest. Uh, this, unfortunately, this area burned quite a bit, but um, the falls, I believe, uh, and the immediate area are intact, though there are other closures in uh, Lassen National Park. I think it really had a lot of fire damage. These falls, they're not the highest in California, but I would argue they're among the most beautiful. Um, you can get very close to the falls and they are just this kind of wide horizontal, as you can see, streaming water. Um, it's very beautiful. The state park that it's in also has um, hiking options. There are all kinds of trails. I will warn that uh, Bernie does get snow in winter. Uh, not a whole lot because it's not super high elevation, but it is high enough and they do get snow. So you may want to have your chains uh, with you in your car. Uh, this is also a great area for families. I should have mentioned this before. I don't know how many of you would think about camping. There is a lovely campground here. You know, winter camping is a whole different, you need a lot of layers. You need a really warm zero graded bag, you know, in a good tent. Uh, so if you are up to it, this would be a great winter destination, um, even if you felt rugged enough to uh, camp there. Sundial Bridge. I just uh, really, really like this bridge. Um, it is in what they call Turtle Bay, which is in Redding. And it's part of a bigger, a bigger complex that has a botanic garden. And you are right near the Santa, uh, Sacramento River bike path. So um, you can hook into the bike path easily from the bridge. I specifically went out of my way to go see this bridge. It was um, designed and created by Santiago Calatrava, Spanish architect. He recently did the wonderful World Trade Transit Center, if you've seen it in New York City. But this was his first US uh, uh, creation. And it's just really beautiful. I don't know that it functions quite as a sundial as the way it was intended. But I will tell you for photographers, you can get angle upon angle of this, um, the sweeping dial and the blue sky. And, and it just is really a fun place. Um, Sacramento River is beautiful. You can hike along it, you can bike along it. You could, you know, if you feel like doing five miles or whatever, and then, um, there is also the nearby Botanic Garden, which is just lovely. You can tour that as well. So it's, it's a whole complex. I believe there's a science museum there as well. So there's a whole complex, totally worth it. Go for the photos of the bridge. That's my advice. 
Catalina. Catalina always tops my list, um, except for on a really hot summer day. Um, I would recommend, what I always recommend, I would recommend going to the Two Harbors side of Catalina. Um, you know, I, one of the things I do at the Times is uh, write the Wild, the outdoors newsletter. So I'm always looking for these outdoors experiences. The Two Harbors side of the island is far less visited and offers views like this, where it is far less populated. So at Two Harbors, there is a lodge there. There are, I think, maybe a few Airbnb places, and there are campsites. Again, Catalina's pretty, you know, it shouldn't get so cold that you couldn't camp if you wanted to plan a camping trip. And I am a big fan of the, what is called the Trans Catalina, the Trans Catalina Island Trail. And they have constructed a trail that goes from Avalon all the way to Two Harbors and out to a point called Parsons Landing on the western side. And it goes through just what you're seeing, all this really beautiful rugged terrain. You don't have to do the whole hike. Um, you can stay over in Two Harbors and do some day hikes and it is just lovely. You can, what the great thing about Two Harbors is you can hike to either side of the island. So the views are, you know, you're either looking back at LA or you're looking out to sea. And there are just these wonderful ridge lines that it just is just really beautiful. What I like about this is you're only an hour away by boat and you can feel like you're in another country. So Catalina is high on my list. If you do choose to go and stay on the Avalon side, there is transport to the wild side. Uh, so you could do some hiking and then uh, grab either a, it, they have some buses and I think they have taxis. You know, there are no um, cars on the island for visitors. So you would be, you know, going to Avalon or to Two Harbors and you would not be using a car or renting a car. That's, which I kind of like. It kind of gets you off the, off the driving track. Okay, now I have a series of what I call these little uh, nature reserves and nature preserves that are run by small organizations, small, um, and they really, really are such an interesting experience compared to your national park experience. National parks are awesome. They have so, they offer so much. These little preserves are really places to go for day hiking and day trips. Although here at Wind Wolves Preserve, you can camp, I believe year round. And I think the camping is free, uh, as I recall. So Wind Wolves, it, technically its address is Bakersfield, but it's not the Bakersfield you're thinking about. It's very near the Tejon Ranch area. And it's about 30 square miles and you drive in, there is an education center and a visitor center. When I was there, uh, I think they were, I can't remember if they were open or not, or they had some outdoor stuff they were doing with people, but at any rate, it, because of COVID. At any rate, um, you park and there is uh, hiking trails. The hiking trails will take you in toward the grasslands. Uh, there's also a little waterfall that you can drive to and then start your hike from there. And this is one of those places where if you really wanna get a glimpse of what Southern California might've looked like if it had never been developed, uh, this is the place. It's kind of the Western Mojave Desert, but it's also coastal range. Now it was and is a working, um, ranch. Um, some cattle do graze here. Uh, and you will see tule elk, if you're lucky, also grazing here. So this is a preserve that very carefully, you know, clearly the cattle are not native, but that has worked to bring back wildlife and tule elk in this area. I believe they were reintroduced here hmm, decades ago and they have kind of a nice population. So this is a, just a great day trip. You're right up, you know, just a little past Tejon Ranch and um, definitely worth exploring. 
Ah, the Ramona grasslands. This is a preserve that I drove miles and miles and finally found. I was starting to think it didn't exist. It is in Ramona, somewhat near, I, would, I guess I would call it North San Diego County. What I liked about this so much is it's this wonderful, you know, we aren't in just native grasslands that often. This also was a grazing area, so it has some non-native grasses and whatnot. So it's this lovely kind of plains atmosphere with like boulders strewn around and these nice big rounded oak trees uh, that you see every so often. There's a really simple trail that you follow. It's super easy, kind of can't get lost. Occasionally you'll see horseback riders. I just loved this area because there aren't too many places I hike, like I say, where you get that plains feeling and you can kind of see forever. Now, I will tell you this, if you are afraid of cattle, this would not be a hike for you. I was surprised they allow cattle grazing. So um, sometimes you're walking pretty close, the cattle are pretty mellow. So I never felt you know they were gonna do anything to me, but just know that they will be on the trail. The added bonus of this is the road that I was driving out on, and I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, you go through wine country, just this beautiful, um, gosh, I felt like at every, it's a windy road and you kind of take your time and there are just all these vineyards along the way. So that would be an added bonus. This Elfin Forest Preserve uh, down in Escondido near San Diego, I found this again at the end of, um, it, it was in a funny complex where there was some residential and you kind of hopped off the five freeway and then boom, there you were. Um, Elfin Forest sounds so cute. It just means that it's kind of low lying chaparral and you can see from the photos, there's like buckwheat and lupin and sages and all this kind of thing. What I liked about it is you have the option, there's a beautiful river you can hike along and there's an area in the river where if you just wanna have a place to kind of meditate or sit or the kids just want to be or play, uh, this is a great spot. It's uh, very quiet mostly used by locals. So maybe like at five o'clock or three o'clock when the kids are getting out of school, you know, there'll be more traffic than usual. But I found it during the day to be just really charming. Um, in addition, you can turn away from the water. And as you can see in the photo on the left and you start climbing up and you just get these beautiful views of the hills in that Northern San Diego County area. Um, just really, really pretty. It's a good workout. The trails are all well labeled, so you won't get lost. And this, I remember particularly, this and another one coming up is um, very dog friendly. And there are even, there are signs posted. There are times of the day and days of the week when you can let your dog go unleashed. So I know that for dog lovers, that's a real draw. And this is one of those places that kind of has, has it all laid out as to when and where your dog can go leashless, otherwise they stay on leashes. But again, a very dog friendly place and just really beautiful. Encinitas, um, I have over, I only recently, I was there last month, I kind of overlooked this area. Um, I just hadn't spent a lot of time. It is the sweet, what you're seeing on the right is Moonlight Beach, which is boom, right in the center of town. This is one of those very close knit uh, coastal communities. And what I liked about it is that it's all very walkable. So here you are, you know, it's, it's a rocky beach. It's not a sandy beach. Um, where you could, you know, walk along the, the shoreline and then you can just within a half a mile tops, uh, you're in town and it has all these great restaurants and places and clubs. And I was, I happened to have been there on a Friday night and it was really hopping in the restaurants, you know, all, you know, all of them were, uh, um, had outdoor components, uh, because of COVID. And it was just lovely. People seemed to be out. People seemed to just 
really be enjoying themselves. And I, I just was struck with how pretty the whole juxtaposition of beach and the little town. So I would put this on the list. A lot of people tell me, oh, I've been to San Diego so many times. Well, here's a spot to stop that's not San Diego, but near enough. Santa Margarita River Nature Preserve. This is another one. This is also North San Diego County. This is another one of those small preserves, good for day trips. Um, it is in Fallbrook. And it, it what, the wonderful thing is, you know, water is always in short supply on hikes. So I love anytime I can hike along a river. This is a beautiful river preserve. Uh, it's kind of surrounded by developments that have come up, but they managed to save this piece uh, of land and it is just really lovely. So you can take a long loop uh, as you head out. Um, the loop, you can go uphill and again, get these great views of the surrounding mountains and some of the grasslands and whatnot, or you can stay along the river. I would say it's like, um, you can do three to five miles. Uh, if you have children, again, the water's great. If they just want to play and stay in one place and, and kind of hang out. Um, it's just really, really sweet. It's, a, it's just a very pretty area. Um, I really give kudos it, to the preserve organizers because it is one of those places that could have easily gotten developed. So I'm glad it's still there and that people can go and experience this habitat. Oh, my last one, Sensorio. Um, you may have heard about this. You may not have heard about it. If you haven't been to Paso Robles in a while, and I had not, I was surprised to see how just really lovely the town, um, the town had developed. It, you know, years ago, it was just a super small town. Now it's got this beautiful town square and not far from Paso Robles is Sensorio. This has been around for about three years. I, this is the second time I've been and I thought it was just stunning. I know there's a lot of light shows and a lot of light immersion and whatnot, but this one to me completely works. It is not a holiday light show, but basically uh, there was the owner of this massive piece of open space outside of Paso Robles he wanted to do something with the space other than you know farm it or use it as a ranch. And someone said, hey, there's this artist who set up this light display in Australia. So he flew to Australia to Uluru Rock where the artist Bruce Munro had constructed a very similar light show. And he talked to Munro and said, hey, would you design something? I've got this big piece of land. So um, that's, is the creation of Sensorio. And it is just beautiful. I highly recommend going, you know, in winter it gets dark early, going about an hour before it gets dark so you can kind of watch it light up. Um, it's very easy walking. I would say it's probably a mile, mile and a half tops. And it is just lovely. I mean, this is one of those immersion things that to me really works. Um, the, the flowers, if you will, the light sensors are all solar and it gets very windy up there. So I think in the month of January, they do some work on the place. So it may not be open. Um, I believe it is going to be extended through uh, 2022. Like I said, it's been here for about three years, but I think they're gonna extend it. It is, it is just really lovely. <clears throat> there is no music. So you kind of walk through and do the paths. It's kind of self-guided. They added, what are called wine bottle towers. Whereas on one side, you go into this area where there is music and um, it's columns of wine bottles lighted up. Personally, I like the open space lights better, but um, there is a new attraction if you've already been to Sensorium. If you've never been, I recommend it. Uh, one thing, go, going in winter is great because it gets dark early, so you have more time. It, they open the gates, I think, at 4.30 till 10, something like that. 
You can get a VIP ticket and have wine on a patio, or uh, you can just, I think tickets are around $48. That's what I recall. I should have looked that up. And um, it's just fun. It's just fun and it's beautiful. So if you're tired of Christmas lights, but you still like lights, <laughs> this is a good place to go. And that's it, I think, for my recommendations. Christine, do we have any questions from readers or readers, listeners? Is Christine still I'm here? I'm sorry. I'm, no, I'm sorry. I was unmuted. I did, That's I, okay. I was muted. I didn't unmute myself. Thank you so much, Mary, for the fabulous um, tour of California. I was interested really in the preserves. Um, I'm not that familiar with preserves. Everybody knows, of course, with national parks, but preserves, um, something that maybe I'm not used to, but maybe a lot of our um, listeners are. Right. Um, I really recommend them, you know, and, you know, state parks and national parks are always going to have that allure and they're going to always be very crowded, but these little preserves are just so fun. You can just about open up a map of California and find all these little spots and uh, they, they really make nice day trips. If you're staying in the area, it just adds to the, to the visit. So I recommend them. So you find the preserves. I mean, actually, you could probably go on the internet and type in exactly all the preserves and find a list of them because this looks like you've been all over the state from the north to the south. Yes, the and occasionally, preserves. I'll be honest. I'll just find myself someplace like San Diego. I'll just look on my Google map and kind of make it big, and I'll go, "Oh, here's a preserve I've never heard of," and I will just go. So it's kind of, kind of a, a fun exploration. But it was that easy for me to find some of these preserves. So, uh, which is your favorite one? What What would you recommend? How would you rank? Oh, them? I, I got to tell you, and it, it's so close to LA. I just Wind Wolves, and the name Wind Wolves. I bet I meant to mention because I just love that name. The name conveys the way grasslands look in a wind, and you think a wolf is moving through it. So it's got this lovely poetic name. There are no wolves at Wind Wolves. <laughs> there no are wolves. <laughs> fluttering, just kind of fluttering grasslands or, you know, that, that might make you think you will see coyotes potentially, but um, yeah, no wolves, just the Wind Wolves. And the reason why I like it so much is it is close. Uh, people can get there really easily and it just, it's just, like I say, it just has that old California feel. Um, it's the, the coastal ranges, it's just beautiful. The hiking's pretty easy. It's just a good place to like kick back and feel like you're not in LA and it's not that far away. So can you camp on preserves or you really can just go and visit most, them? Most preserves are day, day use. However, Wind Wolves allows camping. They have a beautiful camping area. And I, I hope I'm remembering this right. I believe it's free. So it's, you know, their whole, the whole mission of preserves is to preserve a particular land for the flora or the fauna and to make it accessible to the public. Most of these are operated by nonprofits. And so they make camping free to people so they will come and explore it. Now you do have to sign up in advance because you don't wanna show up and not have a spot. And I believe there was like 12 or 15 camping spots at Wind Wolves. So if someone wants to know, I know you told us where it was, where is Wind Wolves? What oh, part? I'm sorry. It's technically the address says Bakersfield, but when I think of Bakersfield, I think of the town. So it is very near as you're going north on the five, very near the Tejon Ranch and that whole area. Um, so it's maybe, ooh, I want to say 60 miles north of downtown LA. So it's not, not so far. Good for a day trip. And then if you want to try out camping, you can camp there. So this MacArthur Burning Falls looks absolutely spectacular. And it's, it's um, the largest waterfall in California. Would that be bigger than a waterfall in Yosemite? Or we're, well, we're putting, it's not. It's, 
it's it's, it's, it's not the tallest. <laughs> Okay. It's not the tallest, but it's got this wide. Oh, panorama. the wide, the widest. Yeah, so that makes it, and it just has just a, it, you can walk right down to the falls. Um, it's just a really beautiful, and what I call, too, a little bit of what I call that old-fashioned state park, very scenic little campgrounds that are easy to, to, you know, access, and then trails galore. Again, I'm not sure. I know the fire swept through farther north in Lassen. I believe Bernie also, and that area also has some fire damage, but I believe the falls are in the state park. I know the state park is open, so... Okay, so you talked about Joshua Tree. Now, actually, we had a program um, for Joshua Tree in the summertime, and um, the rangers there presented it for us. But oh, nice. What, um, was there a particular walk someone wants to know in Joshua Tree that you enjoyed, or did you just go and, um, it's a big area, huge area. It is a huge area, and I want to warn people, it's easy to get lost, even for experienced hikers. I mean, the desert's kind of hard to navigate, so I tend to stay on established trails or ones that are assigned. I really recommend, I had mentioned the Barker Dam. It's a very easy trail. It's a mile. And you, what's so great about it is you're in these boulders and there's water and you're in the desert and you'll see birds fly in and it's just just really, really pretty. I think the other most popular hike uh, is Wonderland of Rocks, which is just, and Jumbo Rocks area, which is where some of the camping is. Um, getting camping reservations like anything else at Yosemite or Death Valley or Joshua Tree can be really challenging and you really have to um, book in advance. So I know a lot of people don't want to camp in winter because it is really cold in the desert at night. So, you know, look around 29 Palms and that area uh, for a place to stay um, if you want to do the motel thing instead of camping. Okay, now someone was, um, wanted to know about if you are a female traveling by yourself. Where would you recommend or you would feel safe or where should someone go on one of these um, you destinations? Know, that's a really interesting story. I often am traveling alone. I really feel, you know, we can never predict complete safety, right? And you always have to take precautions and your own personal safety. I think you can't go wrong with the California coast. Places like Morro Bay. Cambria, um, Paso Robles. These are just lovely communities. Um, they welcome visitors and they, you know, the star of the show is the ocean and the, the hikes that you can do overlooking the ocean or along the ocean. You don't have to be up in the mountains. So to me, those are great places, you know, go on a kayak ride, um, take a walk, go look at the sea otters. Uh, these are just really good places where I feel pretty confident. I don't feel like I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I'm isolated. So I think the California coast is usually a good bet. Okay, so I know that you uh, write this wonderful, um, The Wild. Yes. Especially. So can you tell us all more about The Wild? Because that's actually how people can join, join it and get regular communication from you. So you can just Google the wild Los Angeles times and you'll see a way to sign up. You do not have to be a subscriber. You, it's free. And basically it's kind of a column that I do every week um, comes out Thursday mornings. It goes to your email box and what, you know, there is really no kind of go-to outdoors news place for, for Southern California. We are such an outdoors culture and there isn't really, I mean, you can, Go to REI and read their blog, but in terms of an unbranded kind of news site, we're kind of the only ones doing this. So please join the wild. Um, I love getting mail from my readers. They absolutely, you know, it is just such a positive experience. We exchange news about all kinds, you know, when what's closed, what's open, what fires are happening, where to go. It's it's all centered around really enjoying Southern California and the outdoors. Well, it's a wonderful, 
Um, Thank you. It's absolutely wonderful. It's how I actually discovered you. And I do encourage everybody to get at least um, the weekend LA Times because the articles in the Saturday section or in the Sunday are spectacular. Thank um, you. And it tells you where where to go and you see, you think of places that you just hadn't thought of, just exactly what you've told us about today. Um, yeah, last, last week, my colleague, uh, Matt Pollack, wrote a story about, um, it was called Trails and Ales. So you could go hiking. So it listed 30 different hikes you could do. It's also online. Uh, 30 different hikes you could do. And then a craft beer place not far from the trailhead. I thought that was brilliant. I'm not a beer drinker, but Matt knew all the places. So that to me is just a wonderful guide, a wonderful way of, you know, people like their rewards. Um, hopefully you're, you're having the beer after the hike and not before, so you don't get lost. But um, I just thought that was a really, really smart piece. Right, especially in the fall and the winter time. In the summertime, that would be a hard, very hot to do that, perhaps. Yes, yes. yes to do that. So, so how would you, would you rank these? If, if someone wants to do just one or start off with one, how is, are some easier than others or some are more advanced or um, just start um, San Diego and work your way north or, or, or LA to Hollywood? The Hollywood sign would be the one closest to okay. us. Okay, so yes, if you're in LA, you've got to go do the Hollywood sign hike. That's, that's a given. Uh, everybody who calls themselves an Angelino needs to experience that. But I would, I would do the coastal route. And I think, again, spring and summer, that can be just treacherous driving. And you don't even have to go all the way up. I mean, going as far as, say, San Simeon. So you get to stop at Morro Bay. You get to, well, you get to stop at Pismo see the butterflies. You get to go to Oso Flaco Lake, which is a real hidden gem. And you can even go on and look at the Nipomo Dunes and that whole area. Uh, then you just keep going north. Then you get to Morro Bay. Then you get to Cambria. Then you head inland and go to Paso Robles and see Sensorio. So I think, I think that would be a good itinerary. Um, in, a, in a week's time, you know, you could do this trip in four to five days even just taking your time. And there's always stuff to see along the way because it's the coast. Who doesn't want to stop at the coast? We stopped in Cayucos, which is a lovely little, again, small community, just on our way, just stopped at a little beach walk, got back in the car and kept going. Well, and I know this summer when you presented for us, you had just um, finished a wonderful hike um, in Santa Catalina. Um, yes. I am such a fan. And so that sounded absolutely wonderful to be able to do too. Yes, if anybody is a hiker and is interested in doing the whole Trans-Catalina hike, I think it's 37 miles, something like that. Um, I did do a story about what you can expect. Uh, it's pretty easy to book in advance. You book all your, there's about four campsites and um, it's just a beautiful exploration of that island. And it's so close. I, I often forget to tell people about the Channel Islands, a little harder to get to out of Ventura, a little harder to get to um, because they are farther off and there are, there are less facilities on those islands. But I do want to mention that because Anacapa is awesome, Santa Cruz Island. I think of those as more spring, summer uh, than winter. So if people want to camp in the winter time, you're recommending a certain type of a tent, a certain type of sleeping bag. Yeah. yeah, you know, this is not, you know, I always appreciate people who said, oh, we left summer camping so much, now we're gonna do winter camping. And then they're like, oh my God, I didn't sleep, I was freezing, I went in the car. So one of the things you wanna do is absolutely check the temperatures and the weather for where you're going. Uh, some very surprising areas may get snow that you didn't think would get snow because, hey, we're in the desert. Well, if you're in the high desert, the high desert gets snow. So you always want to check the weather. And you really, you know, I'm somebody, I want to be comfortable in a tent. So uh, you really need a sleeping bag, probably rated to 20 degrees or zero degrees. That only means that it will keep you warm in 20 degree weather or zero degree weather. 
because again, I just like to keep warm. Even by day, you will need layers. Uh, so now you're talking about a fleece layer and a down layer, and you want to have rain pants and you want to have a rain jacket in case you encounter uh, inclement weather. So it requires a little bit more planning. It's not just your flip flops, your shorts, throw the tent in the car. Uh, you definitely want to be more prepared. And in my mind, you can't ever have too many layers. I always, during winter, even just casual hikes in uh, Southern California, I always have a fleece hat in the car, gloves, a neck gaiter to keep me warm, a down jacket just to have in my car because you never know. It could be really cold or what I call California cold. <laughs> Yeah, well, yes, California cold for people for their Easterners. Exactly. <laughs> they, they think this is maybe springtime, springtime exactly. here. So you talked about Death Valley. Um, you've been probably to Scotty's Castle. Is that um, yes. it's interesting to see that? Because that's, that's a ways from the main part of Death Valley. It's a I nice don't know if you know, Scotty's Castle had a lot of damage wow. from some flooding about, I want to say, four or five years ago. So it has been closed this whole time. And they are trying very hard to rebuild. I actually think the castle was okay. I think some of the outbuildings and I think the road is what got washed out. So the park service has been working on this, I would say good four or five years. Uh, so Scotty's castle isn't open the way it once was, hopefully soon. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that because it's yeah. probably maybe 10 years since I've been there. And that was yeah. Amazing to learn all about Scotty um, when you- Such a whimsical I, character. Yeah. A very whimsical character, definitely, definitely. So, uh, well, I encourage everyone to um, sign up for The Wild. And so do you want to give the address again, Mary, so that everybody can- um, The easiest- <laughs> You can write to me at thewild at latimes.com and I will send you a link to sign up. The easiest way to sign up is really just to Google Los Angeles Times and The Wild and it'll pop up on your screen and it'll have a sign up box. Well, I encourage everyone to do that. And I thank you so much, Mary, for participating with us in the Pasadena Public Library for these programs about summer and winter travel and camping. They're invaluable resources to everyone. And, and the LA Times, the editors have been very gracious to do these programs for the library. Ben Nims, um, one of the food editors is doing a program on Monday, December the 20th for us. And if you saw yesterday in the LA Times, that wonderful section all about holiday baking and holiday cookies that made you just want to hurry up and bake them so that you could eat them, he's going to be talking about <laughs> Um, all of his holiday baking. So um, it's a wonderful resource for the um, community here in Los Angeles. And um, everybody's saying thank you very much for all your terrific oh, information. And we thank you so much, Mary, for all your time and effort for us. So happy travels, everybody. Um, let Mary know where you went. And if maybe, yeah, maybe if you discover something that Mary hasn't talked about that you particularly like, um, drop uh, Mary because an email, it's mary.forgoing at latimes.com. So yep. thank you, Mary, for always saying yes. And happy travels to everybody. And have a happy wonderful holiday season. Thank you to everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>